Hello and welcome to Talking with Fence People. My name is Jose Eric, and this is the exciting TI action belt that you're going to get by watching this video. You're going to get a few different things in your action belt. You're going to get some genealogy DRPs, including some difficult ones. If you want to really see if you're TI dominant or FI dominant or whatever, you can try doing all these problems here if you want. You're going to get a link to this document, you get a link to this document. This is some syllogisms and deductive reasoning problems. And you're going to get a link to this fun document as well. This fun document has got some fun questions. I found this document the other day. Um, and especially this argumentation question is a good one for a TI DOM to ask themselves. It gives you four possible ways in which you think you argue and you can self-identify as such. I'm not going to go over those questions, however, in this video. In this video, <coughs> I'm going to go over one through eight of this. And I thought about it ahead of time. I started this video. This is the second time I started it. The first time I was a little bit aimless. I want to make sure I'm purposeful and move quickly and don't waste time. This video is specifically for ENTPs, ESTPs, INTPs, uh, EISTPs. And they're, I think they're the most capable of understanding all the argumentational stuff and implementing it in their own lives successfully for benefit. The thing is, it helps to understand all this stuff a lot when dealing with argumentation out in the world because you can explain things to people as to why, you know, whatever. You've got good explanations. So I'm going to go through it quickly, one through eight, and that'll be the end of this video. I'll do the next section of it um, in another video, but I will link to it in this video so you can see the whole thing yourself if you want to. Argumentational mechanics for strategic debate. What argumentation is and does. Arguments attribute statuses to matters under consideration or relevant to such matters. Agreement comprises one way to resolve a status and dispute. We could just agree. In that case, we don't need to argue it any further. Argumentational victory is another. I can win the argument, in which case that resolves the status and dispute for the purposes of externals, like the group agrees now that that's the thing, but do not necessarily change your opinion. Argumentation is always manifest conditionally. We also never argue about what is. Instead, we argue about what ought to do. What we ought to do, given what is. Sometimes we'll argue about what is until that's resolved, but that'll usually resolve pretty easily. Two, truth, proof, and soundness. Truth. Every statement has a truth value, and nothing but statements have truth value. Value can be true, false, or no truth value. Arguments comprise multiple statements. Multiple statements comprise truth via connectives. Statement connectives include and, or, if, then, and not. Example, if I say Kim and Eric ate at Denny's last night, I'm making two claims. Eric ate at Denny's last night and Kim ate at Denny's last night. We could represent this as E and K. For proposition E and K, a value of true requires both that E be true and that K be true, because it's and. If the example used or, then it would have a value determined accordingly. Either E or K, or both, needs to be true for the proposition E or K to be considered to be to attain a status of true. To establish and substantiate a claim is to earn the right to argumentationally argumentatively or operate as though that claim were true until and unless the substantiated rebuttal is established and thus switches the status of the formerly true for the purposes of debate, claim to back to unsubstantiated or in dispute. So there's a back and forth quality to it and a flow. In other words, arguments proceed along a series of, it, they're ordinal. They proceed one after the other. One responds to another. They can circle back around, but um, nevertheless, they're linked to each other and things that are on the flow don't go away until the argument or discussion, the matter under dispute is, is concluded. Validity. Valid equals deductively legitimate. An argument can be made of true premises and a true conclusion and still be invalid. All humans breathe, Ian breathes, therefore Ian is a human. Each statement is true, and yet the true conclusion statement, Ian is a human, is not substantiated. It's not substantiated by the reasoning. It may be the case that Ian is a human, but it's not the case that he's a human because all humans breathe and Ian breathes. That's not why he's a human. Definitions. An argument is said to be valid if, when the negation of the conclusion is added to the premises, it causes contradictory premises. So this does not cause contradictory premises. If you negate the conclusion, therefore Ian is not a human, it doesn't contradict any of the premises. Ian is not a human. All humans breathe. Ian, Ian breathes. That doesn't create any contradictions. 
Another definition is an argument is said to be valid when it is so that if the premises are true, the conclusion definitionally must be true. This is sort of the traditional definition. This is an operational definition, so it's preferable. Soundness refers to arguments that are both valid and true. Arguments can be deemed unsound for any number of shortcomings, even when they are largely withstand rhetorical scrutiny on their merits when decontextualized. So in other words, there are particular considerations that can render an argument that might sound very sound and solid irrelevant. Like, you know, abortion is almost one of those issues where it's, uh, it's a unique moral question. There's no other moral question that really is equivalent that we face in life, and that's because we're dealing with a human being that nobody's ever met before. And our understanding of exist existence is basically to exist something must be observed. Uh, the only person who can observe the the entity that's being aborted is the person who's choosing to abort that entity. And normally, one has control over what only you personally can observe, namely your own feelings and shit, your own body. Of course, it's a trickier question than all of that, isn't it? Because, in fact, others can observe a pregnancy if it's further, far enough along, and regardless... You're dealing with somebody who is itself an observer, as anybody who's been pregnant and had a child kicking inside of them knows, or anybody who's fathered a child and felt the kick, child kicking inside the mother knows. The entity is alive before it is born and experiencing things, reacting to external stimuli and such. Now, you might say it's not doing that instantly, but we have no reason to conclude that, just because we aren't measuring response to stimuli doesn't mean it's not responding to stimuli. It is a living organism of some sort and a distinct organism from the mother. So it's a unique moral question. It's hard to apply normal moral rules to it. And when we do, we it tends to fall apart. Like, if you go, okay, well, but it's, your, it's the mother's body. But it's not the mother's body you're aborting. It's something inside the mother's body. Um, or, you know, it's murder. Well, okay, but... If it were murder, then it would bear the qualities of murder. Namely, there'd be a mourning family and victim. You know, it's like there'd be a body to clean up. And, you know, it's like, is an abortion, is plan B murder? Where nobody's observed this, whether the thing exists or not? In fact, whether you don't even know if it exists, but you run the risk that it might, and therefore take the pill? You can see how it gets messy. And it's because in certain circumstances, the particularist question, the particulars of the question... Uh, render our universal understandings of things less or more relevant. Okay, so that's what I mean by decontextualized. Debate versus street arguing. There is no difference. Street arguing is just debate by incompetence. Burdens. AF has the burden to affirm. AF simply refers to the party making the claim in dispute. The claim that is being argued about, a.k.a. the resolution. The person making the claim always has the burden to substantiate it, or we ought not behave as though it were true if we disagree with it. Reciprocal burdens, or if we don't want to. If reciprocal burdens refer to the stickiness of arguments. In other words, if I say that we can't do X because of environmental damage, and then you prove my advocacy Y causes more environmental damage than X, uh, then you successfully negated my advocacy. However, if I say no to X because of economic harms, then point out Y causes fewer environmental damages, has impact on the debate, but does not necessarily negate. Reciprocal burdens is how people hold each other communicatively accountable. Number six, elements of an argument. Claims. Assert a link between object X and impact Y. For example, oranges are healthy. X equals Y. Warrants. Explain why we ought accept as true for the purposes of the argument the link and therefore the impact claimed. They have vitamin C. Impact. Impacts are usually predicated, predicted as outcomes as of an advocacy. Uh, but in, they not necessarily say... If you do this, then this will happen. It could just be like, eating oranges therefore prevents colds, and that's important. We're preventing your cold is the predicted outcome. Predicted impacts are usually in life saved, sanctity in life, dollars gained or lost, general utility and agency, or liberty preserved, quality of life. This one would be basically the last one, quality of life, somehow. It wouldn't exactly be... It, it, it can collapse down to liberty preserved still, but... Um, that's not normally how we think about it. Well, that's why we don't normally argue about oranges being healthy. Normative claims. Principalist ones, anyway, typically impact more abstractly than physical claims. You know, what you call prescriptive claims. That is, say, tells you what you ought to do for your interests, but not have any ethical or moral element to it. 
7. Levels of argumentation. Meta framework. We should affirm or negate for reasons unrelated to the locutionary content of the assertion made by the resolution. In other words, we should ignore what the resolution actually says and pay attention to some underlying assumption of it or some quality of it that says, uh, like, for example, eating oranges is good for you, is the resolution. I could critique the resolution by saying, making claims about what's good for other people is inherently wrong. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about oranges or health or anything, it's always wrong for you to do that and therefore we should negate this resolution. That would be a meta framework argument. Framework. We should affirm or negate for reasons related to definitional limits established in arguments about what the topic means. So I've defined vitamin C as dog poop, and you've not disputed that definition. So unless you can prove the dog poop is healthy for you to eat, then we should negate. Contention level. We should affirm or negate for specific reasons under one or both frameworks, which define criteria for legitimation under each advocacy or negation. In other words, calculating impacts under each framework. Well, under my framework, we should choose the fruit that's most healthy, and I've established that orange is the most healthy, so I went under my framework. Under your framework, you've said we should choose the fruit that tastes best, but I pointed out that oranges actually taste best, too, so I went under your framework as well, so the judge should vote for me. Eight, manners of substantiation, kinds of warrants. Depends on the kind of claim. The descriptive and predictive claims, for example, off utilize different means of substantiation. Descriptive claims can be established by evidence. Evidence can be data from studies, news reports or, of, or of, of events, citations of expert analysis even. Generally, simple descriptive claims don't stay in dispute long because evidence is concrete and determinate. Whether the truth of a descriptive claim matters depends on the magnitude of the described impact established. It might be descriptively true that this helps people in some way, but if it only helps them by giving them one penny, then it's not significant enough to win the round, probably. Predictive claims rely on accurate approximations of system dynamics, and so can only establish relative strength via probability. To be considered true for the purposes of debate, a predictive claim need be warranted as much more likely than a given alternative. Accepting consideration of magnitude. So one thing that happens in, in impact calculations and debate is there's probability, magnitude, and time frame. If the magnitude of something is total annihilation of the of all human life on the planet, that's called a terminal impact. And they can say, even though my terminal impact is unlikely, it's more important than it's more important that we prevent that terminal impact than anything else, because that's terminal impact. So you should vote for me because I've established it's likely enough that it warrants us taking action to prevent it from happening. Um, normative claims concern ethics. These things concern ethics, morality, and legitimacy attained through means other than self-interest. Deal in universals and evaluate prospective decisions by removing particular concerns specific to individuals and replacing them with instances that can be processed by a general rule. So by and large, then, uh, TI prefers arguing under normative frameworks, and TE people prefer arguing under utilitarian frameworks. Um, FI types will often argue under TE, TI style language, but not make any sense. Three, normative claims are established usually by comparison against a standard or normative adjudicatory mechanism such as deontology, negative rights, obligatory altruism, something like that. Arguments over normative claims, then, are more likely than not to collapse to an argument over which normative system is preferable. After all, if both parties use the same test key, then there wouldn't be a normative claim in dispute in the first place. <clears throat> B. Mechanism arguments. Explain how a force vector within a system impacts how a given advocacy affects the environment of that system rather than how it generates impacts within the environment of the system. So this means that you say, look, we need to apply this rule the same every time, even if it produces unjust results, because that's if we change the mechanism to eliminate that aspect that we don't like of it, it breaks the mechanism, and the thing that's much more important that we like uh, doesn't survive anymore. Um, normative impacts often rely on the need to maintain system integrity and thus often turn to mechanism arguments to turn to attain predicted outcomes. Predicted impacts. If we bomb, this is, so these are all, what are these things we're talking about here? Let me remind myself. This is eight. Different kinds of warrants, different kinds of substantiating an argument. So, like, evidence is one. Um, 
probability, establishing probabilities, also by evidence, basically, is to normative kinds of warrants are ones that appeal to a standard or a rule rather than the particular circumstances. Mechanism arguments appeal to the need, the, the way that setting up a mechanism that establishes statuses, for example, or judges something, is a better way to achieve long-term solvency than addressing it directly. Changing the changing the architecture is a better way to, to fix something than addressing the symptom, so to speak. Predicted impacts. This is another way you can establish establish what you're trying to establish. You know, substantiate your impact or your warrant is to establish to establish an argument chain in favor of your position on the resolution is to predict impacts if we do what you say. If we're you're advocating advocating in favor of bombing ISIS, you go, if we bomb ISIS there will be less trouble for us. If you're trying to negate that claim, you can attack the link, show why the action won't produce the claimed outcome. This is like a direct refutation refutation. You can turn the link show why it will produce the opposite outcome. This is called a link turn. You can turn the impact, show why a less troublesome ISIS is actually a bad thing. This is an impact turn. If you show like somehow the U.S. benefits from chaos in the Middle East or whatever. By establishing disadvantages, showing how other impacts not predicted by the claimant will also happen, be good or bad, and outweigh the opponent's impacts. So, well, yeah, it may make them less trouble to us, but it will cause them to destroy all of Western Europe. So, we should... Um, we shouldn't do it anyway. By arguing framework and thereby rendering the argumentation chains of the opponent moot in deciding the round by virtue of winning definitional and observational argument chains. This is a framework or ground kind of approach. And it's like, uh, I didn't put an example here, but um, it's like saying, well, I've defined ISIS as this little subgroup here of people who aren't ISIS, actually. Like, you know, I've defined ISIS as school children in the region, and therefore... We should negate because you didn't dispute that definition, and therefore that's what ISIS is, and you keep saying you should bomb school children in the region rather than terrorists. And so I went on ground argument. Uh, F, by arguing meta framework regarding the discourse linking back to such critique, or by, by arguing meta framework regarding the discourse, or regarding a link, or by linking back to such critique of the resolution. So meta framework stuff is like cri critics, as they're called, or critiques in debate, but they're called K's, and it's spelled like that in debate for some reason. Uh, one would be a discourse K would be you refer to me using my non-preferred gender program pronoun while making your argument about ISIS, so you should lose the round because that's more important than our pretend ISIS talk. Example two. The resolution makes bad assumptions inherently, and your argument exemplifies what's bad, and so vote for me. In other words, the resolution's inherently phrased in such a way that it, it suggests we evaluate this on a utilitarian calculus, and that's inherently bad, so we should never vote for this resolution no matter what it says, once we've established the utilitarianism un that underlies it. G. By arguing the style argument is against the rules somehow. Uh, your ISIS argument is unfair because... It, but like you wouldn't really work on this ISIS, particular ISIS argument. We, there's not much theory you could run on it. But an example of theory argument is you're running multiple conditional counter plans, and that not ought be rewarded, but or but instead discouraged for the good of debate. Running multiple conditional counter plans on neg means going. We should do this instead, or this instead, or this instead, or this instead, or this instead of what you say. And I'm not stuck to any of those. If you defeat any of them, I'll drop them. I'll kick them. And whatever's standing at the end, that's the conditionality that we should take instead of your thing. The problem with counterplans in general and conditional counterplans is NEG doesn't have fiat, which means NEG can't assume that there's a political will to pass their bill enough to argue the predicted impacts as though they were happening. They have to first pass that, that, that hurdle. Um, and so the... Well, it depends. It's complicated. Counterplans and, and plan inclusive counterplans are a complicated bit of debate that requires a lot of a lot of articulation. I don't want to go into right now. But there's, and it's not really necessary. It's important to understand that there's this 
requirement of if you're running a counter plan, we should do X instead. You're trying to get around the fact that we're supposed to resolve this question first. Then we can talk about your question about what you, your advocacy is. I'm on F here. I'm advocating we should do Mia. When you say we should do Mia instead, and when you say we should do Mia instead of Mia, then I'm saying, okay, well, let's talk about whether we should do Mia. But before we talk about that, let's resolve the question about whether we should do Mia. The only way you can even begin to talk about Mia is if Mia is both exclusive of what I'm saying, that is to say, we can't do both. Because if we could do both, then we'll talk about whether we should do yours next. But um, it needs to be exclusive of mine, and it also needs to solve the same problem as mine. No, the reason I'm bringing up what I think we should do, instead of talking about what you think we should do, is because if we do what I think, we get better results on your criterion, and we can't do both of those things, so I have to bring it up now, because if we vote on your thing and it passes, then we won't be able to do my thing. And as a consequence, if we're gonna if we're gonna gain the benefit of my preferable idea, then we have to do it instead of yours, not and that means that has to be addressed right now as a as a policy question. So that's the, that's why Karen plans are okay at all, but they have to be exclusive and they have to solve the same problem. Otherwise, it's a separate question that needs to be addressed next. Um, appeal to principle and standard. Establish the specifics of the standard. It might be like just war theory is an example of a, of a standard sort of normative framework that you can use to appeal to and say, we should use just war theory to, as, to determine this question because it already exists. It's a, a normative framework that provides answers on questions exactly like this. It's the best humans have come up with yet as to how to address questions like this. So it's what we ought to use. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, fuck, I dropped that piece of weed. Okay, well, whatever. I just smoked this bong up and it's fine. I don't need to put that stuff on it. Okay. Um, in order to do this, you need to establish why the standard ought to be preferred for it ought to be the preferred one for the purposes of this debate. A lot of times there are competing standards. You know, like there's international realism is one way of, of approaching um, the foreign policy, but that says that nations don't act like moral agents and don't have duties and such, and I tend to agree with that in general. But the question of whether it's descriptive or normative itself is an open one, and yada, yada, yada. Um, except that your advocacy or negation is consistent with the standard you've delineated, at least more so than that of your opponent. Uh, such argumentation relies primarily on reasoning, logical consistency, built from consensus intuitive truths regarding morality. Note that that's at the root of it all, is there, there's no real logical foundation in morality. It's a consensus intuitive, intuitive consensus that it's not okay to maim toddlers with circular saws randomly. So if your normative system produces a moral status of acceptable regarding that claim, then your normative system does not withstand scrutiny simply because it evaluates some actions in ways that contradict near universal consensus regarding the ethics of certain kinds of actions. So um, that might be unsatisfying to a TI user, that it's rooted somehow in this just gut intuition, intuition consensus that something's not okay. You could argue as well that it's, it's rooted in something with a little bit more TI sustainability, like, what the fuck did I do with that thing? Oh, there it is. The TI sustainability, like, uh, like, like ownership, self-ownership. You know, you can say, well, the reason we know that uh, it's not okay is because to say it's okay is to it yourself affirm implicitly slavery, that other people's bodies are your possession that you can do with or at least can become your possession that you can do with as you please since almost nobody is willing to openly affirm slavery you can say it's a ti necessary reality of what i would call an intuitive um intuitively appalling notion right Flow pacting arguments. Arguments having to do having only to do with how things established on the flow with course of the argumentation that's already occurred related to other objects established on the flow Objects on the flow that include the resolution, which is a single static object on the flow that is established by neither party, but that is affirmed by the AF. In reality, in street argument, it's established by the person who's making the claim that's disputed. So, 
It's a person who says, bah, 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 and you go, I don't think that's true. Well, then they're the app and you're the neck. <laughs> Framework objects. Definition through observations, criteria. important thing that people ought to do when having arguments with other people that often is not done is define terms and set up a criterion. How do we know who wins this argument? What wins it? <sighs> you can agree on a criterion and they can actually be determined. Contention level warrants are justifications that hold up impacts. As is pointed out up here, you know, like different kinds of establishing of impacts right here. And then here, we start getting into negation area tactics, right? But um, but even negation area tactics are really a, a strategy of doing the same thing, which is establishing some sort of impact on the flow. It might be the impact of knocking over your opponent's argument, and that's what flow packing arguments are about. They're not about any longer the predicted impacts on the contention level or definitional level even, but just how those things relate to each other. So, <clears throat> objects include framework objects, definitions of observations and criteria, contention level warrants, that's the justification parts of arguments on the contention, contention level impacts, there are matters to be weighed against one another in determining the winner of a given argument chain. The claim doesn't, is sort of an object, it's sort of basically a tag, but it really the claim just is like a tag for the warrant and impact relationship. Um, contention level impacts matters to be weighed against one another in determining the win and run over a given argument chain. Mantles, tags regarding the statuses of objects on the flow. Example, their second subpoint under contention 2 is not standing because they dropped my corruption rebuttal warrant. Um, not standing is a mantle that you just put onto an argument. Another mantle might be voter. This argument is a voter here, Judge, because, and you explain why, it wins you the round by itself even if you lose all the other ones. Flow packing impacts. How mantles interrelate is flow packing. So that's what I was just demonstrating right there is if we look at the different arguments here, Judge, this one is still standing and it's a voter because it's got this much impact and his things don't have that much impact. And nah, 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 nah. Matters to be weighed against one another in determining the statuses of objects on the flow. What does that mean? I don't know why that's there. Matters to be weighed against one another in determining the statuses of objects on the flow. Okay, so I guess this is this is actually is a good point. It's basically like links, you know, links where yeah, that's that's very meta understanding. I shouldn't even really put that there. Okay, uh, voters standing arguments positioned as round decisive, decisive, right? So is this argument standing. My opponent hasn't rebutted it. They dropped it, or I counter the rebuttal, and as it stands, it's round decisive. It's the winner. It's going to usually be round decisive under one framework. So it's a voter under my framework, and it's it's a reason why. And maybe so. Additionally, it, it has impact under his framework too, but. You know, usually going to be a, a voter under one, and maybe a voter, maybe a contributor in other, in underneath the other framework. Contradiction. Pointing out a contradiction requires one of the following, provided it is called out correctly. Your opponent must kick one of the contradictory claims. To concede, to kick is to concede on a given warrant or chain. Um, so if I say, look, your first argument here contradicts with your second argument, and you can't have both. This one says we should bomb ISIS in Saudi Arabia. But this one says we should use the same planes and bombs that you're advocating for the first one to bomb ISIS in Afghanistan. That's not possible. You have to kick one of them. You must explain how the presentation of contradictory premises. You must explain how the presentation of contradictory premises. Uh, invalidates. 
You need to explain which of the two you wish to address. You must then address it. You must make theory arguments to why you now get to choose which of the arguments your opponent is actually making if they don't kick it, if they don't kick one. You must make theory arguments as to why you now get to choose which of the arguments... What's going on here? Somebody like me wasn't being very careful. Can reciprocal, you can utilize reciprocal burdens to establish your own contradictory claims, impact them, and then demand the opponent and judge accept all impacts from both sets of contradictory claims or none from either. So in other words, basically say, okay, these two contradictory claims exist. Now, if it's okay for him to have both of them and not kick one, then it's okay for me to have contradictory claims too. And I'm going to set up these two contradictory claims, and you got to accept those as well, and that's going to cause just, you know, and it'll be something ridiculous, you know. Double bind. A debater double binds himself when he claims that X is necessary for Y and also that Y must be present in order for X to manifest. In that case, you point out the double bind and you say, he, you, you, that's irresolvable. You can't resolve that by kicking it. You lose both. Um, but you got to explain that to the judge. Example, South Korea should deploy THAAD, which is terminal high altitude uh, something defense, aerial defense or something like that. South Korea needs to improve relations with North Korea. South Korea can do so by getting rid of THAAD because THAAD worsens relations with North Korea. But in order to better relations by getting rid of THAAD, they first need to have THAAD. So they've double bound themselves there. They're, they're trying to make an argument that we should keep THAAD so that we can get rid of it later to, to uh, make North Korea happy. But if getting rid of THAAD makes North Korea happy, why wait? Why not do it now? Turn, most powerful form of argumentation. The ideal turn begins by quoting words your opponent has said. My opponent has said this, however, it actually works against him. Impact under frameworks. Um, this is another kind of, of argument you can make uh, that is, is pretty straightforward. It's just like, you know, you say, well, look, under my framework, it's more important than this and whatever and then you have to make prefer my framework arguments you go this is why we should prefer my framework where where my arguments have the most impact over his framework where his arguments have the most impact because my framework is better because blah, blah, blah. so those are all the different kinds of basically manners of substantiation that you can make right it's basically as many as i could possibly think of and i've been deeply immersed in debate for a long time. A lot of these things are all, are at n most of this stuff, almost none of it is my ideas. You know, like, these terms are normal in debate. They're normal debate jargon. Kick, you know. I, I've organized the thing ideationally. Like, I've created a an over overview of the whole thing that I don't think adequately existed prior to me making it. But all of these ideas existed in debate, except perhaps... For, like I, I don't think debate. I've never heard anybody refer to mantles before in debate. I've never heard anybody before refer to uh, kinds of warrants as vectors. Nor have I heard really any uh, any good solid um, taxonomy of the different vectors and such. Which is what I'm trying to do in the milk lab, which is a a debate strategy card game. So okay, that's it. I said I was going to go through eight. That's all I went through. I will share this document. And I'll put it on the video upload, and I hope you enjoy that, or at least find it useful. I it, I know these kind of videos aren't for everybody, that a lot of people find them boring, they think it's too dense, too fast, or whatever. That's fine, that's totally fine, I get it. It's, it's, it's what it is, but there's a lot of TI people out there who will find their entire argumentational world opened up when they understand these concepts because they're tailor-made to do it. I've been inspired by Simon uh, to share this with him and to, I think I made a video about this document before, but to take a more concerted effort to make a good video that's timed well and, and doesn't waste any time and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you liked it, and if you didn't, then fuck off! But if you didn't and you're still watching, then you've got a bad relationship with your F.I., I'm going to play a little song here. It's called Rock Song. Wait, I think I played that on another video. I have another. I have a new song I could play that I haven't played. I played this once. Uh, I know. I'll just play the song. This one here. Western Buddha. It's only the first 
30 seconds or so of a song. Why is it that only the first 30 seconds? Because somebody's gotten into my pants again and squeezed my wiener. Yes, somebody's gotten into my pants again and squeezed my wiener is one of the most common complaints we hear around here. For sure. Uh, let's go ahead and unmute and let's go ahead and unmute and see what we got. See what we got with this song. Is it mixed well? I don't know. Sauce is Brittany, crossed with Beckers, minus two badges, and plus one Pecker. That's what that said there. Pretty clever, huh? Uh, last bit is just me freestyling whatever I don't know but uh, yeah that song is kind of like a couplet song you know convex concave what's the difference one's like sex and one's like Christmas when I laid down have I lied not when the line is uncontrived purgatory sits between hell and heaven and idol and splits shut off down from Revan Sauce is Brittany, crossed with Beckers, minus two badges and plus one pecker. You say you are a rebel, with compliance, rebellion needn't act out in defiance. But breathlessness and eagerness to pleases runs restless opposition to your thesis. Yeah. So... Because I'm any T.I. and not T.I.N.E., I really care more about that than I do about the argument and stuff like that. I really do. I care more about this by a large margin. I always will. I can't help it. It's It matters more to me. I'd rather just sit here and, and play my music for people, but, you know, nobody fucking wants it. To, I just don't have that many people who want to listen to my music. They're much more interested in, in ideas that are useful to them, which I totally understand. So I'll bid you do with this. Goodbye. It doesn't have any lyrics. I could make them up while we're playing it. There I put on the headphones that should be adequate for me to see. Whether words would like to be here and whether they would fit over that deer. Ha cha 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 cha. What I said was ha cha 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 cha. That's what I said. You were wondering what I'd said. It was ha cha 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 cha. And the drama and epic heavy clouds with snow and thunders you can feel the seriousness in this part we won't give up not now not ever we're committed to a future that's as bright as a billion suns uh uh, eh, eh, uh, I think this song's pretty good, but I don't know what 
I would do with it lyrically if I were to come up with some words to go over it. Would they be tough enough? It requires some kind of thing that, I don't know, it seems kind of like an instrumental, you know? It doesn't really need anything else. Bum, ba, dum, bum. I could try to rap over it. Rippity, rippity, rippity rap. Yeah. I'm a rapping, just like a napkin at the restaurant, all folded up, wipes up ketchup, so too, is it just like that, it's a rapper, I'm a rapper, I like to rap things, and I like to rap over things, instead of something like that. Um, so yeah, it doesn't... It, it, I don't know what to do with that. And your current instrumental. I've got words for it written down, actually. Alright, that's it. Goodbye. Hi, Kimberly. What are you doing?